So I'm going to read for 14 minutes, and I'll read um, two pieces. The, and my background, as um, Jane said, is in a different kind of science, the earth sciences, geology. Uh, this is from a book called Science and Steeple Flower. Field Guide to Southern Virginia. True as the circumference to its center, Woods Creek Grocery, Rockbridge County. Twin boys peer from the front window, cheeks bulging with fireballs. Sand plum trees flower in clusters by the levee. She makes a knot on the inside knob and ties my arms up against the door. Williamsburg Green, with a touch as faint as a watermark, tracing cephalon, pygidium, glabella. Sway back through freshly cut stalks, stalks the yellow cat. Can you smell where the analyses end? The orchard oriole begins. Slaps her breasts lightly to see them quiver, delighting in this. Desiccation cracks and plant debris throughout the interval. In the Blackwater River, fish nets float from a tupelo's spongy root chopped into corks. There may be sprawling precursors, descendant clades there are none. The gambit declined was less promising, so the flock of crows slaughtered all 60 lambs. Toward the east, red and yellow colors prevail. Praying at the graveside, holding forth the palm of his hand as a symbol of God's book. For the entirety of the Ordovician. With termites, Mrs. Elsinore explained, as with the afterlife, remember, there are two sides to the floor. A verb for inserting and retrieving green olives with the tongue from the scissure of your thighs. In addition, the trilobites were tectonically deformed. Snap-on tools glinting from magenta loose strife, the air sultry with creosote and cicadas. You made me to lie down in a peri Gondwanan back arc basin. Roses of wave ripples and gutter casts, your sex hidden by goat's beard. Laminations in the sediment, all preserved as internal molds in a soft lilac shale. Egrets picketing the spines of cattle in fields edged with common tansy, flowers my father gathered for my mother to chew to induce abortion, a common cosmopolitan agnostoid lithophases naked in the foothills. I love the character of your intelligence, its cast as well as pitch, the border wide without marginal spines, at high angles to the inferred shoreline. It is the flute, the thin flute, of the clavicles, each rain pit above them, the hypothesis of flexural loading, orioles pink as steeple flower. One particular day, 400 million years ago, the mud stiffened and held the stroke of waves, orbital motion, Raking leaves from the raspberries, you uncover a nest of spring salamanders. And the second piece I'll read is um, from a book called Red Start and Ecological Poetics. In one of the beginnings, oh, and it's called... Um, the Carboniferous and Ecopoetics. The Carboniferous, you know what the Carboniferous is. <clears throat> In one of the beginnings, below the fluff and leaf-encrusted surface of a wide, shallow body of water, microscopic spores swirl with bat-winged algae, a cloudy soup of exertions and excretions. The sea drizzles its grit into rich mud. Trilobites are dying off. Miles Davis could have been quoting nature when he said, I listen to what I can leave out. 
Brachiopods, mollusks, and corals cluster in wide, shallow seas riven by sharks. Thick fish with lungs and lobes are giving way to a new species, the lung reconfigured as a swim bladder. Like surreal underwater candelabra, crinoids effloresce. On long, branching stems, they stretch upward toward the waves, each arm filtering small animals and plants into the calyx where a mouth is hidden. Aquatic insects begin leaping from the water to escape fish. In some, the gill plates take on the quality of wings. Donde una puerta, cierre otra abre. As Cervantes writes, where one door closes, another opens. The Carboniferous gives rise to six-winged insects. They need compound eyes for navigation. There are bugs that would look ordinary to us, and there are giants, huge mayflies, and predatory dragonflies with 30-inch wingspans. They hover over bouquet-sized spiders and a sort of millipede that grows five feet long. Because there are no flowers, the insects are plant suckers and spore feeders. They eat seeds still unprotected by fruit, and they eat each other. They live in burrow holes and on the forest floor, and they colonize tree crowns. They jump, crawl, and soar into and out of the canopy. Below, in the umbratial interval between one step and another, a tetrapod resembling a large newt freezes and blinks into the sound of the world, the chirp and whir of insects and the high-frequency mutter of its own species. Franz brush fronds in a light breeze. And what, eons later, does the Kreutzer Sonata, which Tolstoy deems dangerous for its capacity to arouse erotic feelings, what does that music have over this sound? The animal blinks again, its hydraulic limbs holding it above smudged tracks that mark where other, others of its kind mated their mouths popping, cheeks, muscles bulging. Five tumescent digits on each foot channel ground vibrations into neural impulses. It takes stock and goes on. I'm still alive then. That may come in useful, Beckett's Malloy quips. The air is rich with the smell of chlorophyll. Oxygen levels are spiked. There are no flowers, no pollens, no vivid plant colors. There are no grasses. But vegetation is beginning to climb slopes, reducing runoff and erosion. The first mosses have appeared. In the Carboniferous, the graves are considerable. At the end of their life cycles, plants toppled into the water and mud and loam. They accumulate so quickly they don't have time to decay. Branches, seeds, leaves, and debris fall into pools already thick with aquatic plants and algal blooms. The buried mass goes brown and peaty under an ever-increasing load. Beneath hundreds of thousands of meters of overlying rot, the peat beds contract like a frog's iris into thin horizontal lines. Water, oxygen, and hydrogen are pressed out. The organics harden into lignite. While the swampy basin continues to subside, heat and intensifying pressure metamorphize the lignite into soft coal. Ceroidal masses of minerals like calcite and fool's gold bind and clot in the seams. In 1673, two Frenchmen document coal beds in Illinois. Not until the 19th century industrial revolution is coal assiduously mined. Shafts are drilled into coal seams, room, rooms pillared with timber are excavated. In dusty lamplight, miners break down the coal face with a hand auger, a pickaxe, and blasting powder. In every cubic meter of air they breathe, four to eight billion dust particles circulate. Once a day, the fire boss comes through with a safety light and checks for gas. From before the Civil War to the mid-20th century, men separate coal from shale and rock binder, and they shovel the coal into loading cars by hand. Billions of tons are heaved and cleared from mines by human muscle. Chinese workers arrive in the U.S. and help lay rails for coal-fired locomotives. Jimmy Rogers sings. Jimmy Rogers records the singing brakeman. 
Because most coal contains pyrite ferrous sulfide and ferrous sulfide, combustion releases sulfur gas. Sulfur dioxide, nitrous oxide, and mercury, all toxic, plume into the air. And so, of course, does carbon dioxide. Isotopic fingerprinting of carbon in the atm atmosphere links it directly to the burning of, car uh, of, car of fossil fuels. Coal is the dirtiest fossil fuel, producing twice as much carbon dioxide as natural gas. CO2 in the air, its density increasing 200 times faster than ever before, captures reflected heat and holds it to the face of the planet like a pillow. Some scientists estimate that coal will provide half the world's energy by the year 2100. A hundred years after that, all the exploitable resource reserves of coal in the earth will be exhausted. A poem, even excavated from its context and the time of its writing, is a curiously renewable form of energy. <laughs> it is hard to be sure whether it is from the future or the past that the poet Henry Vaughan writes, they are all gone into the world of light, and I alone sit lingering here. Thank you. Thank you.